Hey guys, welcome back to Watch With Us. My name is John Keel. I am here with one of my very good friends, Rob, Spanish Rob Velasquez. What's up, buddy? How's it going? Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for jumping on the call on quick notice, man. Um, we've got some fun stuff happening, or I shouldn't say fun, some interesting stuff happening that I, I, I felt it was poignant that we jump on a call and, and kind of hash out and talk it out a little bit and let people know what the heck's going on because it's not out there. What do you think? I'm really glad you uh, hit me up about this because this is actually a, a, a very important topic. It, we're talking about people's livelihood here. Uh, so this kind of hits close to home for people working in the watch industry um, because this news, not really good news, but definitely news. So I'm glad you were to, able to hit me up so we can like get, in, uh, get on it and talk about it as soon as possible and let the people know because uh, this is uh, affecting uh, a good friend of both of ours. Yes. Who's uh, an industry guy who's been around, who's uh, on the ground floor doing sales, has his own business, and uh, well loved and respected in the community. So uh, let's Absolutely. talk it out. Let's hash it out. Yeah. So, I mean, look, the watch industry, for any, anybody who's watching this, obviously watches YouTube. They follow the blogs, they follow uh, the podcasts. There's been a ton of controversies going on, a couple of big ones that everybody's been talking about. But there's one that I've known about for quite a while that Rob has known, known about for quite a while. And it is the, uh, the lawsuit between Hamilton International, otherwise known as a, or owned by Swatch Group. So it's the Swatch Group is suing Vortic watches. And, you know, it's not something most people have heard about. And it's actually a very, very big deal, right, Rob? It's a really big deal. It's been pretty hush-hush for obvious reasons because it's been going through – um, it's a legal case. It's a public open legal case, but for the most part, you know, uh, RT from Vorta can't really talk much about it. He's still, you know, the, it's pending, uh, legal case. So, um, it hasn't made so much press. And the reality is, um, a lot of journalists who survive and need swatch money can't necessarily bite the hand that feeds them. Right. So a couple of years ago when this kind of surfaced and he was like, Hey man, this is like a really big deal. I kind of need help. I need help possibly publicizing or letting people know about this. And a few of us were all on board. Like we would love to help you in whatever way possible and, right. and get on board and, and talk to people. And I reached out to a couple of people in the industry, a couple of other journalists. And unfortunately a lot of us couldn't do anything. We couldn't bite the hand that feeds us. A lot of us are good friends with people at Swatch Group. A lot of us, go to Basel. A lot of us deal with the brands. I work with yeah. the brands on the retail side and the, the journalist side. So I, you know, I can't necessarily bite the hand that feeds me either. Um, but you know, it, this is, we're coming to a head where it's almost over and I think it's about time we actually kind of talk about it. So, yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think we should obviously preface this whole conversation with the fact that personally, I love the Swatch group. Uh, I love the brands in the Swatch group. I mean, heck I'm wearing an Omega now, you know, and this isn't so much a dig at Swatch Group, but on the same token, it's kind of a, a David and Goliath type of thing. Um, so, I mean, before we get too far into it, let's let's kind of give everybody who is not aware of Vortic nor the uh, possibly the lawsuit, you know, a little bit of background. I mean, so as you mentioned, RT's a very good friend of both mine and yours, right? Um, for those of you who have no idea who RT Custer is, uh, he's genuinely one of the nicest human beings I've ever met, and honestly, a very good friend of mine. Um, he, along with Tyler Wolf, founded Vortic Watches, I believe it was 2014, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they kicked the kickstart. It was sometime in 2014. They started making watches by 2015. And what they do is they, they repurpose or upcycle vintage pocket watch movements from the late 1800s, the early 1900s, American made pocket watches. They take the movements, the dials and the hands, which are original from, you know, the turn of the century, the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. And they encase them into American made in-house made cases as well as I believe the straps and the buckles and so forth are also made in Colorado where Vortic is and they sell them. And that's their, that's their gig, man. That's what they do. And uh, so the bulk of what they make is really the case is the straps and the buckles. And then they, if you look at a Vortic and it's a Waltham pocket watch that they uh, upscale upcycled, it's going to say Waltham on the dial. 
but it's obviously going to be a hundred year old dial, hundred year old hands. And the movement itself is a hundred years old. Um, I think I pretty much nailed it. Do you agree, Rob? Yeah, no, that's, that's basically it. I mean, in the very beginning, it's been an evolution. When I was working with Watch Time 2015, I remember they had just came on the scene and they started advertising with us at Watch Time and um, they blew up. Uh, they, their original concept was these 3D printed cases out of titanium and they were the first to make 3D printed cases from titanium. And I remember at the time, there were two part cases that they had kind of like, kind of like put together and right. then they repurposed, they upcycled, like you said, these pocket watch movements from a lot of different watchmakers from Waltham to Elgin. Hamilton and a handful of others and whatever they can get their hands on and just the, the, the dials and the hands and everything were just so pristine. They're just so immaculate. They'd find some really good stuff and they were, they were really, really clever. And to be honest, it was such an incredible movement for the movement of people collecting pocket watches and having them evolve to wrist watches, which is way more popular because pocket oh, yeah. watches aren't as popular, obviously, for, for obvious reasons. So right. Not. You know, right. So. I mean, the other thing, the other thing is too, is, you know, you, you get somebody, you could contact Vortic and if you've got your granddad's old pocket watch and it's not working and it's something you'll never carry around with you, you could send that to them and they'll actually create a wristwatch out of your own pocket watch. I mean, it's what they were doing is, is really honestly something that nobody else in the industry is doing. And, um, mm -hmm. and they did it in the best, most clean, honest way. Uh, uh, the, you know, Again, if you if you don't know RT, he's just he's just one of those guys. He's passionate and he's honest and he's a good dude. Um, so that's really what they do. So back early on in Vortex, uh, you know, uh, business, they received a uh, a cease and desist letter from Hamilton because Hamilton was claiming that by selling Vortex watches, which they were, with hundred year old Hamilton dials, hands and movements and selling them as Vortec. And even though on their listing pages and any bit of their advertising, there's a disclaimer that says we are in no way associated to Hamilton or Elgin or Waltham or Illinois or any of these other pocket watch companies. Uh, it's very, very plain and clear what they are, but for some reason Swatch felt threatened and felt like they had to sue, uh, to sue Vortic. Um, you know, and, we, and you know thing, what it is? It's that Swatch Group is a huge conglomerate, public company, has shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. And they have a whole team, a legal team in, you know, in every, you know, geographic. So in North America, they have a huge legal team that's on retainer. That gets a lot of money to look for this kind of stuff and right. do something about this actual literal kind of stuff. So I get it. It's, it's, there's a team of lawyers. That's their job to literally find this stuff and then battle it and fight it and try to bully them into cease and desisting. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's not, it's hard to say how much of this is like Nicholas Hayek's doing. Is he like, Oh, I want to crush all these micro brands. You know, it's hard to say. And it's probably, I doubt it, I doubt it goes I, that far. Right. I doubt, I doubt he even knows. Maybe there's a good chance that they don't even know that Vortec exists, you know, okay. but there's a legal team who's trying to impress their bosses. They have to do what they have to do. It's their job. It's their life. Right. But, so it's their job to uh, bully them into submission and then take them to court and see what they can get out of it. You know? Yeah. So, you know, just this past year when, when we went to Basel, uh, I was talking to RT both before and while at Basel. And um, he said, he said, I'm trying to actually get in touch with Nick Hayek to say, Hey, can we grab a cup of coffee and sit down and talk this out? You know, my feeling personally is there's nobody in the world who's going to believe that, a Vortec that you purchase with a hundred year old movement and dial in hands is being counterfeited or sold as a Hamilton. And RT's feeling was that if he can get in front of Nick and say, uh, you know, Mr. Hayek, this is what we do. This is how we do it. It in no way harms the Swatch group or Hamilton. In fact, I even said to RT and I, you know, I, he agrees and other people have spoken about it. If anything, it might help Hamilton. You know, there are a lot of people who might walk into a store like Torno or their local retailer and see Hamilton, but have no idea the rich history. But if Vortic got big enough and got popular enough and people realized who may not be aware of it, that Hamilton is a very historic company. I mean, it was, it was, they made over 5 million pocket watch movements from their inception in the, in the 1800s until they closed their doors in 1969. That's, wow. I mean, they have some history. And then um, I think it was 1971, the holding company that owned Omega and uh, one or two others purchased the Hamilton rights, moved them over to Switzerland. And, um, you know, 
Hamilton has such a rich history that so many people don't know about. Um, granted, watch geeks like you and me. Yeah, we know about it. People, a lot of guys watching this, they know about Hamilton's history. My argument is that, you know, if Vorta got big enough or if they hit the right markets or they hit, hit the right message, it would help people have more appreciation for what Hamilton is. So that's, that's kind of my feeling. So anyway, the, the, the big thing here is we want to kind of let everybody know that this is going on. As you alluded to before, a lot of the industry press will not touch it. And you and I are friends with a lot of the industry press. And I've had conversations with people and you can't blame them right? Because they make their money through advertising, sponsorship, and so on and so forth. And if they come out with something that may seem derogatory towards Swatch, they would lose their livelihood or their, their way of getting, uh, selling advertising to Swatch. So it makes sense. But at, at the very least, they may not lose um, that channel, but it's not good to bite the hand that feeds you. Right. So it's they just might not... They it's might just, lose the first bite at a news story or something. They, it just wouldn't be good for them as a business person. Yeah, it's just not the best idea as a business. And, you know, yeah. as, a, as a business sense, it doesn't. It, yeah, it hey, and hey, look, watch with us right now. It's not big enough to have to worry about making any money because we're not, right? So um, maybe that's why we're not in that same position. Right. We're more about, you know, telling the news unbiasedly and uh, regardless of what that means. So let's just <laughs> let's do the news. Um, I, I like very much uh, Joe Thompson, hero and a friend, is right. always very much the epitome of journalism because he was an unbiased gumshoe. And even when that man going toe to toe with Hayek in the eighties, he did it, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and he's a hero. So to me, anyway. yeah. So like, it, yeah, I, Joe, I, Joe was actually one of the first people I met in the industry back in nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. Um, and I, I have the same sentiments. An amazing guy. And so everybody else is in the press. I mean, ninety nine percent of them are good friends, right? And they're great people. But, you know, they have to look out for their own. I'm, I apologize for looking at my other screen here, but I'm kind of just looking at the notes we want to hit. I mean, one of the, one of the things I want to touch on is the ramifications if Swatch wins, right? So, obviously, you're looking at what it would happen to Vortic and to RT and to Tyler, and that's a given, right? <laughs> It'd be pushed out of business in two seconds. It's a small company, not a lot of money. They've already invested tens and tens of thousands of dollars into fighting this case. But some of the other ramifications, I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on, on what else could happen? I mean, I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear what your ideas might be is if there's a ripple effect. And there is a ripple effect and it wouldn't necessarily be good because now we're suppressing creativity, creativity. So like it's, it's the beginning of a slippery slope where now it, it wouldn't be great. We have a lot of micro brands and some of them are just pure plagiarism. Some of them are just pure copying. Right. And those are really the ones that, brands really should do something more about, but right. again, it doesn't necessarily matter because sometimes they're not even the same pedigree. They're not even in the same field. So let their, let everyone eat. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, something like Vordic completely different demographic. It's, it's an original idea. It's, it's, it's not even remotely similar. The products aren't the same and they don't compete at all. Yeah. So what you're doing is suppressing a segment of the market that's going to stunt creativity in the future when Hayek in you know, the mid two thousands, literally was trying to stop people from using his movements yeah. in 2006, seven, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. so that people can start making their own movements and be more creative. He wanted Switzerland to be more creative. So right. why would we go back on that? You know, right. He wanted to actually sell less to spur more creativity and development within the watch industry. So this is kind of counter effective to what, you know, uh, seniors uh, plan, original ideas and thoughts and plans were, right? Yeah, and, and you know what? If they were to actually win, it wouldn't be a win-win. It would be a lose-lose. Swatch so wouldn't get so watch would get horrible press from it if they actually did suppress and were successful in bringing down a micro-brand American company. And America is a big part of their, of their, of their business. Right. Um, it would not look good and be holding to them. It would just not be good for them because uh, you're not winning anything. You're just, you just, it would just be bad press. And uh, I, I can't see it being a problem. No, and I completely agree with you. And I'd, I'd actually argue that – the ripple effect goes much further than just the watch industry. Um, you know, one of, one of the examples I was using with a friend of mine, and, and this was a handful of months ago when the topic was brought up at a, at a get together. One of the examples I, I, that, that kind of went through my mind is that I, my, my dream is to buy or to own a, a vintage Mustang, a 1966, 67, 68 Mustang. But what I want to do is I want to resto mod it. I want it to have a Mustang body, Mustang chassis. Everything else I want modern. I want the interior to be modern. I want Bluetooth. I want a touchscreen. I want airbags, anti-lock brakes, the whole bit, right? And 
and a lot more power, right? That's like a dream of mine, one of my bucket list things, right? What if I were to think even further than that and say, okay, well, I'm going to start a company and I'm going to buy vintage Mustang bodies and, and, uh, and chassis, and I'm going to create those. The car's still going to have the Mustang badge on it. It's still going to have the Ford badge on it, but the interior might be you no know, leather that's handmade and iPad and whatever it may be. I mean, this case can literally set precedent for any other company in any other industry who's looking to upcycle, who's looking to, to modify anything. And I, I fear that, you know, this one case that's affecting one small business person out in Colorado might actually have much larger effects to other industries. Oh, totally. Let's go. Let's, let's base this on the poster right behind you, the Ford versus Ferrari. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this movie, but it's just, it's, it parallels this story so much because basically what you're describing is, is Carol Shelby who yeah. took a product, enhanced it, kind of modified it, had people fall in love with the brand again, you know, in the movie, spoiler alert, Shelby comes back and kind of helps them defeat Ford, uh, Ford, it helps Ford de defeat Ferrari in right. the Le Mans by making an amazing sports car. It's basically the story of the GT, of the yeah. Ford GT. Yeah. So essentially, they helped Shelby brought, you know, help bring uh, Ford into the future with being popular and bring that sizzle back. And uh, that kind of publicity you can't buy. So, I right. mean, I'm not saying that, you know. <laughs> our team's going to do the make same Hamilton thing. Bigger, but yeah, I mean, horror, I mean, it, you never know. You never know what the future holds. They could the actually be the catalyst to help um, introduce this brand to a completely new generation. Right. The point is, you had a car dealer who was building one-off cars down in Texas at one at a clip, helped one of the biggest brands in the world win the biggest race versus the biggest race car company, and. Not that it really has any direct effect to the Vortex watch thing, but it goes to show you what creativity can do, what having one person with one good idea can do. And again, it doesn't directly correlate to what Vortex could do for Hamilton or vice versa, but by stifling this, it, it, in my opinion, this is the classic David versus Goliath. And I, I genuinely think, again, I love Swatch's products. I love their brands. I think they're very, very wrong here. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, as well. So, so then the reason, the reason that prompted this call, Rob, is that I learned last night that this court or this lawsuit or this court hearing that has been going on since 2015 <clears throat> is coming to a head next Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday is February 19th. So the final, from what I understand, the final, final judgment, court hearing, everything is going to be held in New York City in federal court on um, Wednesday, February 19th, 2020 at 9.30 in the morning. I'll put, a, uh, I'll put in the description of this video below, this is an open court case. So meaning anybody can go and sit through this hearing on uh, next Wednesday. And I know that a couple of us are gonna go, I'm not gonna be able to personally go. I know uh, a couple of us are gonna go. I know other journalists are gonna go um, and then you know, I'm honestly, I'm kind of hoping a little bit that this, if anybody's in New York State, New York City area, uh, will go and, and kind of show support for, for the small guy here, for, for Vortic, for RT, you know. Um, but just so you know, and again, I'll put it in the description, but it's at the Thurgood, uh, Thurgood Marshall U.S. Courthouse, Federal Courtroom 906 at 40 Foley Square in New York, New York, next Wednesday. The hearing starts at 9.30 sharp, so you're going to want to get there at like 9 o'clock, 8.30, 8.45. Um, I'm also, I heard a little, from a little birdie that uh, national news will be there. There will be on the courthouse steps beforehand. There will be members of the national, uh, you know, a big time news, news channel will be there um, filming some interviews. So might have to be there. Yeah, if you guys can make it, anybody can make it. If anybody needs more detail on it, uh, I'll give you what I have. So you can always email me at john at watchgage.com. Um, and then one other thing I did want to mention for anybody who does want to research this whole lawsuit and court case a little more in depth, you can always uh, Google Hamilton, what is it? Hamilton International versus Vortic LLC. 
And then finally, in the description below, I'm going to put a link to something that's pretty interesting. On Watch You Seek, there was a thread that was started, uh, I guess, about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, about this whole thing. Again, we talked about how the industry press isn't picking it up, has never picked it up. So there's a thread on Watch You Seek. I'll put a link in the description below, but it's a pretty interesting read, kind of gives a rundown of, uh, and it's by a Watch You Seek member, so it's, it's their opinion. But there's, it's a longer thread, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of good discussion afterwards, both positive and negative uh, for Vortic or Swatch Group. So, yeah, so that's, that's it, man. Listen, I'm wishing Vortic the best on this one. Again, love, love Swatch's brands and products, but in this case, I think they're off base in a big way. Yeah, this is a pretty, uh, I think, influential and very important case that obviously there's not much media on. It's, I think it's going to be very important this, what happens next Wednesday on the sign, the, the siding, the fate of uh, what's going to happen in the watch industry and what's going to happen to micro brands and uh, what this means for uh, the future of the industry. I think it's a pretty important case. So I'm looking forward to seeing what I, happens. I think as we discussed before, before, you know, it, it far, it could far reach outside of the watch industry as well. So I think yeah, it's interesting as hell. I, uh, yeah, man, thanks for getting on the call on short notice. And one thing we didn't do in the early part of this is heck man, let's go for a watch check. I did mention I'm wearing, uh, I'm wearing my Omega speedy. This is a 2005 Gemini four. That was actually, oh, nice. it was actually a gift. Uh, I got this as a gift from a good friend of mine who worked mm -hmm. for Omega for many years. I got it many years ago. And, uh, one of my, most cherished possessions must be nice yeah must be nice is that the blue dial it is the blue with the silver subs as a matter of fact what's funny about it because it was gift and sentimental i would never sell it but um you know once in a while you go online and see what these things are worth just for giggles right five six years ago you could pick one up for three grand thirty five hundred and now they're going for north of ten in many cases so, that's insane that is right? crazy yeah and that's a whole nother that's a whole nother podcast, whole nother video. Talk about the crazy value of some watch in the industry. But you're wearing something very special from one of my very personal favorite brands. Uh, I'm double wristing as usual every day. If, you, if I'm not double wristing, then it's a clone. It's not me or I'm wearing <laughs> the gym. So be weary if you see me not wearing two watches. Right. Um, so I'm wearing my IWC Galapagos Aqua Great Timer watch. covered in rubber. It's like my everyday. I beat the hell out of it. It has a 12 hour counter, so I'm all about it. And then, special guests on the other wrist, I'm wearing the Moser Streamliner I'm doing a review on right now. I'm photographing and doing video. We, uh, we're doing a review on it. I actually have to return it in a few hours. Um, but just enjoying the hell out of it right now. It's actually a lot more comfortable than you think. And uh, we'll do a review and talk about all the details and get really into it uh, on uh, a video upcoming on watch this channel so check yeah. it out Look and that to. watch is very different for a stereotypical moser right oh very much so ed talks about how he wanted it to be different he didn't want yeah. to be, he didn't want a round case so it's a completely different case than anything they've ever done before and it's um, that integrated bracelet yeah it's got the integrated steel bracelet which they're doing they're jumping on that everyone's been doing it in the last couple of years it makes yep. sense it's what people want yep so it makes sense to, uh, for everyone to, to jump on that um yeah, and it's actually very comfortable it's not as big as it looks online in the photos it looks massive because uh, well you know i'll explain it all later in yeah the, we'll in look the, at, in we'll look forward to that video yeah. but uh i can't wait to see that in person again moser's just literally no exaggeration moser's always been since the day i've seen him uh, years ago, first time. Uh, Moses is one of my favorite brands. So, perfect. Good on them. Good on you. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for jumping on the call, guys. Any questions about this Vortec Hamilton thing? You know, let us know in the description below. And uh, I guarantee you, we're going to come back with a follow up on it. What happens next Wednesday in New York City in U.S. federal court? So, uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. As always, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Follow Rob on Instagram, which I think everybody in the world who likes watches do. Um, we've got an Instagram. We've got a Facebook. Get all about us, guys. Oh, by the way, last, 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 last thing. We've got a new giveaway coming up. Um, not going to get too far into it, but it has something to do with that new Timex automatic that sold out in about an hour. So uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Awesome. Thanks again, Rob. Thank you. All right, See brother. you later. See you. Bye.